In this video we're going to look at how muscles and joints work together as levers and we're also going to take a look at muscles and tendons and how they attach to each other. First of all, let's take a look at how skeletal muscles are organized and how they're basically attached to their tendons. In, in some muscles, we have muscle fibers that are parallel to each other, which basically means we have the muscle fibers kind of coming together like this, and they do kind of merge together on one end and the other, but for the most part, all the fibers are kind of running more or less parallel to each other, and then they're attached to a tendon at either end. So that would be a parallel situation. In a convergent situation, the muscles start all over the place and kind of merge together into a single spot with a tendon here and another kind of broad tendon spread out all along this area. Um, pennate muscles are going to be muscles where you basically have a, a long tendon and then the muscles are either going to be attached all on one side, which would be referred to as unipennate, um, or attached on both sides, which would be multipennate, or another one that I'm not sure I can draw, which would be more three-dimensional, which would be called multipennate. Um, and then the tendon would stick out across the ends. So muscle kind of arranged that way. Almost reminds me of like leaves. If you think about the leaf project you maybe did in AP Bio or something and you think about palmate and pennate type leaves. The last one is the circular muscles and in this situation like around your lips let's say you've got muscles where there is no tendon. The muscles just simply wrap in a circle and meet up with themselves and that allows you to kind of pucker your lips up. So here's an image of each of these types, and up here you can see the parallel muscle, um, fibers kind of more or less parallel, merging together. Um, this is something that would be common in, say, your bicep muscle. The convergent muscle, where they all kind of come together and meet at the tendon, um, this is typical of, say, the pectoralis muscle of the chest where this broad edge is attached to the sternum and this edge here attaches to the humerus. Um, when it comes to the pennate type, we've got a unipennate muscle here. This would be what would happen in, say, the forearm. There's a bipennate muscle here. This is typical of, say, um, either the rectus muscle or the gastrocnemius muscle um, of the leg. And then there's the multipennate, and this is that three-dimensional structure I was kind of mentioning. There's a tendon kind of breaking this into three pieces down the middle, so there's kind of a tendon through here and through here that kind of all pops out the end down here. And this would be typical of, say, your deltoid. Um, and then the circular muscles um, here, um, relaxed and contracted. This is going to be found at, say, the mouth, um, maybe around the eyes for squinting, and um, at the various sphincters in the body, including like the anal sphincter, um, things like that. Okay, when it comes to levers, um, perhaps you can remember the idea of a lever, where we have something called a fulcrum. Um, then you actually have the lever arm itself, and on one end of the lever arm, you apply a force, um, which we're going to call the applied force, um, a push of some kind. And then on the other end, you're going to have a resistance. Um, your typical lever of this sort, which basically acts like a teeter-totter, this is your typical first-class lever. Um, the difference between each of the type of levers is what's in the middle. In a first-class lever, it is the fulcrum, which is in the middle. In a second class lever, it is the resistance, which is in the middle. And in a third class lever, it is the applied force, which is in the middle. So if we took a quick look here, um, if we have a lever and a lever and a lever, and let's say here I put a fulcrum, and there I put a fulcrum, and there I put a fulcrum. Let me get this other stuff out of the way here. 
Um, and now let's say I put an applied force here, and an applied force here, and an applied force there, and then, I'm sorry, those were resistance in the green circle, it's not applied force. And here is applied force, here's an applied force lifting up, and let's say here's an applied force lifting up. Um, in each of these situations, this would be our first class lever, fulcrum's in the middle. This would be our second class lever, because the resistance is in the middle. And this last one would be our third class lever, because the applied force is in the middle. Now let's take a look at how this applies to muscles on the body. Okay, um, this is our first class, or class one lever. Um, there's our fulcrum in the middle, um, fulcrum in the middle. Um, here we have our load or resistance in the middle, and here we have our force in the middle. So this is class one, class two, class three. This would translate into the body in a situation like this. So if you think of your neck pivoting your head up and down like you're nodding, um, that kind of a motion where you tilt your head back and forth like this, um, that is a first class lever. Your fulcrum is in the middle where your occipital bone meets your atlas. The load is the weight of your head itself, and the applied force is the muscle over here that does the motion. Um, a second class lever, uh, again, the load is in the middle, and the fulcrum is on one end. So here's our fulcrum over here by the toes. The load is the body weight being applied, and the force, in this case, is the lifting up of the calf muscles um, causing the body to be lifted upward. Point is the load is in the middle and in this last example um, we have your say your typical bicep type joint. Your, most of your hinge joints are going to fall into this category. Not all of them but most of them. Um, in this case the elbow is the fulcrum and the tendon I'm going to kind of exaggerate the attachment point of the muscle is out here beyond the fulcrum, um, which is where we're lifting up, where the muscle pulls on the radial tuberosity, and then the load is the thing that you would be holding, or just the weight of your arm itself being lifted. So, let's take a little bit closer look at each of these. This is our first class lever again. We have the fulcrum in the middle, and over here it is lined up with your um, neck. The resistance is the weight of your face over here, and then the muscle itself is what applies the force um, to lift your head up. So contracting the neck muscles of your neck lifts your head up this way. Likewise, you have different muscles attached over here that would pull your chin down and lift the back of your head up. Either way, it's a first class lever, and again the key to a first class lever is that the fulcrum is in the middle of the three. Okay, this is a second class lever. In a second class lever, the key thing is that the resistance is in the middle, and in this case the resistance is the body weight coming down the tib and fib onto the ankle. The fulcrum is out here at the toe, and the applied force is back here on the calf muscles that are lifting up the heel by pulling on the calcaneus. Now, kind of the day-to-day -day example of this, um, you could think of as being something like a wheelbarrow. In a wheelbarrow, the resistance is the weight you're lifting up here. You are lifting up on this end, and then the fulcrum would be over here at the point. Um, of the wheel itself. And the last example uh, is a close-up look at the idea of a third class lever. In a third class lever, it's the applied force that is in the middle. Here we've got our fulcrum over here at the elbow joint, the resistance out here on the hand, and the applied force is where the bicep muscle is going to attach to the radial tuberosity. The applied forces and the middle resistance at the end. Day-to-day um, -day examples of this include, say, um, a baseball bat 
the weight of the bat itself is the resistance. The applied force is provided by this person's right hand, kind of holding the bat on top there. And then the fulcrum is um, going to pivot around that lower hand. So the bat, you, when you swing the bat, it, it swings in that kind of manner. Um, another typical example of this would just simply be like a shovel. Um, when you use a shovel, um, not a very good picture of a shovel, but the resistance is down here, the dirt you're picking up, the force is applied in between, and the fulcrum is back here at the end where you hold it with your other hand. So you could even say the same is true for a pair of tweezers. The fulcrum is back here um, where the tweezers are connected, the force is in the middle where you squeeze, and the resistance is out here at the end where you're squeezing some thing. All right, that's this entire deal. I uh, hope you helped.